What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually work through chapter 9 of the Westminster Confession of Faith with respect to, because when you, when you look at the issue of man in the image of God in the Reformed tradition, and actually well before that, going back to Augustine, this logic of the fourfold state of man, if you were here for Johnny Gibson's pre-conference, who was here for the pre-conference? Wow, wasn't that good? Oh, my word. Uh, right here. He made a, kind of a fleeting allusion to it. But I, I, a lot of the theological and practical Christian problems we have today are related to a failure to understand the fourfold states of man. So I, I'm going to go through chapter 9 of the Westminster Confession as we do this. And it begins by saying, God hath endued the will of man with that natural liberty that is neither forced nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined to good or evil. So it's an expression of man's free will. Now, as soon as I use the term free will, I don't want to use it. In fact, in most settings, I, I more commonly say there is no such thing as free will. But that's because I'm dealing with the way the Enlightenment uses free will versus the way free will was used before the Enlightenment. And people say, well, you say there's no free will. The Confession says there is. Well, that's because we mean different things. In our world, free will means I have autonomy. I have an unrestrained ability, and of course this is at work in our society. I am what I say I am. I, my will is, is without constraint. There's a sovereignty to my will. The divines don't mean that. Uh, that is a, a product of uh, post-enlightenment unbelief in our world today. And what's happening is the confession, by the time you get to chapter 9 of the Westminster Confession, it's already taught unconditional election and total depravity. And so they're going, well, but we don't want you to get the wrong impression. We've already said all things that happen happen by the decree of God. God foreordains whatsoever comes to pass. He decrees it. And you are totally depraved so that you are without any spiritual ability at all. Now, the danger is that you would conclude, therefore, I do not have a, I, don't, I do not play an active role in any of this. I'm just flotsam being carried along on the foamy river. Not so. You, uh, you have... You, you have will. You make choices. You have genuine volition. And the confession teaches that that is true in all the states of man. There is a natural liberty. And, and again, it defines it here. Uh, that is neither forced nor by absolutely necess absolute necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. When you chose something, when you did evil or you did good, to the extent that we would call it that, you chose it. And you may, and you may go, well, no, I'm totally depraved. I, I have a, a young son who has now, he's, he's graduating college, he's going to do a PhD program in St. Louis. So I was talking to Dan Doriani today about uh, uh, Church Hopkins in St. Louis. And when he was about five years old, I was, uh, I was giving him verbal reproof for some sin. It was probably talking back to him. He's actually a very sweet, obedient child, but he was being verbally reproved by, by his father. And I said, Jonathan, how could you do that? And he looked at me, the five-year-old little reformed child, and said, Dad, I am totally depraved. <laughs> I said, oh, Mr. Theologian, I'm afraid you have not read chapter 9 of the Confession. <laughs> that though you are totally depraved, you are still culpably depraved. <laughs> because you were, your depravity was not, your acting on that was not forced. But you actually chose in your depravity. Uh, all it shows is how loathsome you are before a holy God and how deserving you are of eternal judgment. But it is not an excuse. You actually, have, you actually chose to sin. And I'm therefore going to administer the fatherly grace of a spanking to your little bottom. <laughs> Remember my mother, uh, we took our, her, my grandchildren, her, my children, her grandchildren, to her apartment in D.C. and. Uh, I think my oldest son was three years old, and I, I spanked him. I didn't beat him. I spanked him. Um, and my mother said, dear, do you have to spank him? Yes. I don't remember ever spanking you. I said, I remember you spanking me. <laughs> with a spoon, with a shoe, with a stick. And thank you for doing so. Uh, we don't teach spanking. We are crazy.
Uh, I've actually, I was in Canada doing a seminar, and they said, you know you're violating the law. And I said, then let them arrest me. We must teach the truth. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm getting a little far afield. But the reason he was guilty was he actually exercised his will. We have freedom to make decisions we do choose. Our choices have consequences. And it's not forced or determined by an absolute necessity of nature to the extent that I'm actually not choosing it. Now, it is constrained by my nature, of course, but not in such a way that I am not expressing my own desire. And the way, I uh, Terry made the comment in the Q&A, Jonathan Edwards in The Freedom of the Will, a very interesting book. Um, he, he's kind of arguing the position with John Locke in, in the English philosophical critics, so you kind of got to know the context of what he's saying and why he's saying it. But Locke claims that the Christian view teaches that the will is, is, you know, is, is non-existent. We deny the will. And Edwards' response says, what do you mean by the will? What you're describing is the exercise of choice in the mind based upon the desires of the nature. And that is true. Uh, Robert Shaw said, the liberty of a moral agent consists in the power of acting according to his choice. You have the power, whether you're fallen or unfallen, when you are glorified in heaven, you will have the power of acting according to your choice. And those actions are free, which are performed without any external compulsion or restraint in consequence of the determinations of his own mind. Uh, Zechariah Sersinus said, the will is able to follow the precedent judgment of the understanding. We choose what we think is best with free and voluntary motion. Now because of this, and this is the particular point the divines want to make. Again, we are responsible for our choices because we freely willed them. Now, if you, if, who, if, if you, I won't have you raise your hand, but you may be fairly new to Calvinism, in which case you're probably arguing with all your old friends. It's an almost inevitable cage phase. You know, I was, I was converted on a Sunday night. I became an evangelical Christian on Sunday night. I became a Calvinist the next Sunday morning because I went to the morning service at 10th Breath and Dr. Boyce was preaching Romans 9. The first sermon I hear as a Christian, I was converted, became a Christian by the sermon, Hosea 3, I was Gomer. I go to church, I was pretty excited. Got a new Bible with a, with a handle on the, remember those things, with a big whopping case. And I walk across the park, I go to church, and I'm pretty excited, I'm wearing a suit. And he doesn't preach predestination, no, he preaches reprobation. And I'm going, this man has lost his mind. <laughs> but anyway, I was mainlined by God directly into the veins of Calvinism from the beginning. Many of you, like my wife, were not. And so she's still angry about Arminianism, truth be told. I mean, she's still got a grudge over some. That, that may not be true, but she's pretty fervent about, about these issues. And, and you may be too. And if you've argued with your friends, they will, you've, they've said to you, well, you don't believe in human responsibility. And you go, why do you say that? Because you believe in predestination. As if the two are mutually exclusive. You believe in the sovereignty of God, therefore you do not believe in the responsibility of man. And our response is, that is not true. I believe in both of them. And, and it is not the case that the Arminians, or whoever you want to discuss, they have their verses, and we have our verses. Ephesians 1, 4, Romans 9, whatever. And so we stay out of their verses, and they stay out of ours. No, they do stay out of ours, as you know. <laughs> Romans stops at Romans 8, you know. But, uh, um, but we have the whole Bible. We embrace the whole Bible. Uh, uh, Charles Hodge's systematic comments, systematic theology, it's kind of humorous how he's, he's not being humorous, but he's dealing with a doctrinal issue, and he'll say, now here's the, the Greek Orthodox view. And then he'll say, this does a good use of handling a small number of scriptures, but leaves out many others. Then he'll do the Arminian view, or, so, or the Roman Catholic view. Well, this actually does a good job of reflecting these scriptures, but it completely ignores these. Then he gets to the reform views, and he adds those in. So it's the whole Bible. And the same Bible that says he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight said, choose this day whom you will serve. For as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Now you go, how can God be 100% sovereign and we're 100% human? I, I, I'm not required to explain that. Now, Sinclair Ferguson has a theory that he mentioned in class one day. He said it's because of American football that's your problem. It seems for <laughs> British people, it always comes down to American football being the problem. And he said, because for you, if the ball's on the 20, it's 20 yards one way, 80 the other. 
and you just think that way. I don't know if that's true. God is 100% sovereign over all things. We are 100% responsible for our choices because we really make our choices. The things that we decide to do, we do without, apart from any constraint on our minds and our hearts. We, what is in our minds and our hearts actually determines what it is that we do. Uh, and uh, it was Ferguson used the example of the Lord Jesus as the proof of this. Uh, not only was Jesus' life predestined, it was largely pre-recorded. And yet, are we going to call him a puppet? He was the freest of all men. Uh, it is a mystery, and it's true. I, I make this as a rule. In the scriptures, wherever the divine and the human touch, where they intersect is mystery. Jesus is God and man. Where's the, where's the line? There is no line for us to see. We, we attribute things that are divine to him. John 4. Jesus is hung tired and he's thirsty, so he sits by the well. Which nature is that? His human nature. Then he knows everything about the woman and tells her about, that's his divine nature. We see them both, but we can't parse out where the line is. We likewise see, the same is true of scripture, by the way, that it's the word of God, it's the word of man. We see that it's, it's a human, I'm preaching Jeremiah, and it's Jeremiah's experiences and Jeremiah's feelings, and yet it's the word of God through the Holy Spirit. Um, we see that both are true. Well, where's the dividing line? I, I, there's a mystery around that. And likewise, on the issue of human responsibility and will versus divine sovereignty, we see in the scriptures, John Calvin said about this issue, where God makes an end of teaching, let us make an end of learning. And let us walk on the handrails of scripture as far out as scripture goes. And the scripture plainly teaches an absolutely sovereign God, which the confession has already done but it simultaneously teaches a, a fully responsible, volitional man. We have, in that sense, a free will. We are responsible. Now, there are, however, powerful influences on our choosing, on our will. Our upbringing and our moral environment affects what we choose. Obviously, that's true. Uh, people who are, this is fascinating, you know, even in terms of sports loyalties. If your father was a football player, you're likely to be a, choose to be a football fan. If your father was an artist, you're more likely, you know, your mother was, we're affected. Our thoughts, our desires, our affections are of course shaped by our upbringing. We have, we're, we're subjected to temptation uh, 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 or oppression. Uh, uh, Terry used the example of a woman who's a gun to her head. That is, a, that is an influence on our decision making. But then we have, and here's the, re here's the real rub, the real thing is the sinful corruption of our nature. That's where the rubber really meets the road. But I make choices. I make real choices. I exercise my will, although my will is not a thing. We're, we're describing an operation. And I do so freely. I do what I think. I do what I want. The problem is I am corrupted in what I think and in what I want. And that is where we understand a biblical understanding. I, I mentioned Jonathan Edwards in The Freedom of the Will. He makes the comment that you may, you're free to do as you please, but you are not free as to please as you please. So I had lunch today, as you know, delivered to me. And I forgot how stressful this is because I'm, I'm really not a picky eater, but there are things I really don't like and they're associated with sandwich foods, mayonnaise, is disgusting. What is, I mean, <laughs> what is wrong with you people? You know, we have this Duke's mayonnaise in South Carolina that everybody's, my wife and daughters are gaga over Duke's. I'm just like, just pass it around me, not across me. What is it? What is it? Is it like some form of rotten eggs and vinegar or something? It, it's disgusting. Now you go, now Rick, it's funny that you hate it so much because I love it. Why do you hate it and I love it? I, I don't know. It's my nature. And how many times in my entire life have I stepped up and said, oh, put lots of mayonnaise on that? How many times have I done that? Zero. And I never will. In fact, I'm old enough, I'm just not eating it if it has mayonnaise. You just think what you want, I'm not eating it. I have, now, why is that? Did I choose not to like mayonnaise? It would be easier, although the thought is so reprehensible. It's hard to even put it in positive, positive terms. Did I, did, I, did I will that I would just, no, no. 
something about my nature, maybe some scarring childhood experience like being forced to eat the nasty stuff, I don't know, uh, has made me revile. Meanwhile, on those occasions where I get ice cream, which is seldom, the likelihood of me ordering butter pecan, the greatest ice cream flavor ever invented, is extremely high. If it's not butter pecan, it's going to be manly vanilla. I'll take vanilla. It's just the greatest thing. And I'm not taking all these peanut butter, these, all my girls, you know. My sons are gone, so I'm stuck with these girls and their crazy ice creams and all the fruity things. And now, why do I choose? Because I love it. I love butter for conscience. Thinking about it right now makes me both gain weight and feel delight in my <laughs> hypothalamus. Um, uh, when did I choose to love butter for conscience? I, I did not choose what I love. I did not, Everett says you may choose according to what you please. You may do as you please. You are not free to please as you please. And our fundamental problem, see, when it comes to our moral decision making, and particularly our relationship to God, is the nature of the corruption of sin on us. The flesh is hostile. The mind of the flesh, Paul says, is hostile to God and is not able to keep his law. Ooh, that's a problem. So the problem is not that man doesn't have free will. It's that the free will is being governed by a hatred of God and by a fundamental inability to understand. 1 Corinthians 2.14. The man without the Spirit does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And we go, yeah, and people don't like the Bible. It seems dumb, and they don't like it. No. And he is not able to. And so the problem lies not in the will, but in the, in the corruption that Donald Gongrey Barnhouse used the example of a, of a radio that had frequencies burned out in it. And the transmission's going out, but it's not being received. Why? Because it, that it's, it's been, those, those frequencies have died in the radio. The, the capacity to receive them has been lost, and the fall has that effect on us. And so we are people who, because of the fall, we have lost the ability to receive God's word. This is one of the ways in which I benefit by being an adult convert. I was 30 years old when I was converted. And I had just moved to Philadelphia a few months earlier. And um, I remember I, I thought, you know, I need to be devout. I need to, I need to read a Bible. I went down to Barnes & Noble. Uh, actually, it was a Borders, that wonderful downtown Philly Borders that no longer exists. And I got a Bible. I got a King James Bible. Uh, yeah, it's a Bible. I got back to my apartment and I tried to read the Sermon on the Mount and it was like, I just couldn't do it. I'm just like, what? What? I mean, and I just, after like 20 minutes, I'm just like, I ah, forget that. What's he, what's he talking about? It wasn't that I chose to become a Christian later. It was because I was brought from death to life. And in my, in my inner response to God, and this, of course, is what Ezekiel says, a new heart I will give you. I will take away your heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. That's why people say, C.S. Lewis says, I came into the kingdom of God kicking and screaming. No, no, he did not. Not at the point of conversion. He, it, what does the Bible say? I will make them willing in the day of my power. It's like Lydia. God opened her heart to believe. And so the issue is the issue of corruption. Now, here's where we get to the fourfold state of man, which is so helpful. And I, you'll see it on page slide five. Reflecting on the Bible, you will see that man's condition with respect to these things differs in four states, and they are man created, Adam in the garden, man fallen in sin, everybody from Adam and sin until you and the day you were converted, or unless you were never converted, uh, man in his regenerate state, and then man in his glorified state. And here's the breakdown. Adam was created able to sin. Adam was created righteous. We saw, if you were here for the, the pre-conference and the Q&A, I, I think in one of the Q&As I pointed out that, uh, oh, it's my, it my opening address yesterday, that when we look at what it means to bear the image of God, the New Testament's reflection, what the New Testament talks about when it refers to the, the restoration of the image of God, is it's in righteousness and holiness, the knowledge of God in righteousness and holiness. And uh, uh, in that state of existence, Adam was righteous, which is kind of an amazing thing. How does a righteous person who is not a sinner, 
How does he choose to sin? It's, it's a mystery. Now, the confessional answer, which I think is what you have to say, is that he, he succumbed to temptation. And that's, uh, there was no sin in Adam until he had sinned. How does a person who is righteous, well, one answer is because he was mutably righteous. So he was in a state where he was able to sin. Clearly, he was able to sin. And, and I, I thought uh, Johnny Gibson really talked well about how that was a provisional state with the intention, if he had passed the covenant of works, of bringing him into that eschatological uh, the final state of man, where he is not able to sin, but he was able to sin. Augustine called it passe peccare. Peccare is the term for sin. He was able to sin. Uh, and then man in his fallen state, unregenerate sinner, is not able not to sin. Non passe, non peccare. We are not able not to sin. And you have all this language uh, from the top of my toes to the bottom, bo from the bottom of my top of my head to the bottom of my toes. It's just all sin, Isaiah says. Even my righteous deeds are filthy rags. The unregenerate man is not able to do anything that is not characteristically sin. Uh, the regenerated man is able not to sin. And we're, I'm just laying it out. We'll look at each of these. What a difference. Let me say right now, uh, we, our generation needs to recover the significance of the new birth. It's really been obscured in our time, in, in the avoidance of legalism. We, we are living in a time, there are legalistic times, and we, by and large, are not living in one. Uh, I'm, believe me, I'm all for Galatians. I believe me, I'm all for justification through faith alone. But we got people in Corinth preaching Galatians all the time. And some Corinthians needs to be preached to the people in Corinth. That would be us in our dissolute culture in our morally lax church with so little thought of the consecration of life. You know, the, the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit by which you are converted affects a radical change in your state with the effect that you who previously were not able to, not to sin, you are able not to sin. I'll stop there because I've got a whole slide on that. And then the good news is you die. So I sometimes say to people, yeah, you're a new convert, congratulations, what, what a blessing. Uh, but uh, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that when you die, you will enter into the glory of the Lord. The bad news is you are young and healthy. <laughs> and there's likely to be a long struggle. You ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Read that. The, uh, the slew of the spawn, the uh, vanity fair. This is your future. And uh, I hope you read Pilgrim's Progress. My, my oldest son led a Pilgrim's Progress study group at college, and none of his Christian friends had ever heard of Pilgrim's Progress. For shame. And they all said, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, but we will be not able to sin in glory. We will be non posse peccari. We will, be, we will not be able to sin. Well, let's look at each of these. Man in his state of innocence had the freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well pleasing, I'm quoting the confession, that which was good and well pleasing to God, yet mutably so, so that he might fall from it. And so pre-fall Adam not only had the freedom to do it, his will was able to do it, he had the power, he had the moral ability to believe and to, and to obey and to fulfill the covenant of works. He had the freedom, he was able to sin but he had the power not to sin. Uh, you think of uh, 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 Ecclesiastes 7.29, God made man upright. That's not, a, that's not talking about his physical form. It's talking about his moral condition. Now, one thing this means is that sinfulness can never be traced back in to creation. And one place where this is, and I'm not harping on this, it just happens to be the battle we're fighting in my own denomination, and many, if you're in any Reformed denomination, this is coming up. Uh, we had the Revoice Conference four years ago now, still undisciplined, um, in which they were promoting gay Christianity. And one of the arguments that was made was that but same-sex attraction is, is God made me this way. It is rooted in creation. Uh, well, if it's, see, if, if it's rooted in creation, it is good. It is one of, the, one of the sessions at the actual Revoice Conference said, um, 
that there will be queer glory, honor, and treasure in heaven. Now, let me just say, I, didn't, I do not despise homosexual or same-sex attracted people. I'm not trying to get you to despise them as people. They are image bearers of God. We're to love them and honor them. But that is false. That the, the things that will be in glory, the treasures, are those things that are made good by God and are restored and redeemed in Christ. There will be nothing in heaven in that, that is glorious to that or a treasure in heaven that is rooted in the fall. And so this lack of, of category clarity is causing people to say, I, I, I'm allowed to self-identify. And it could be something else, by the way. This just happens to be where the culture wants us to capitulate. Um, and, and this is our culture is attacking, sex, I don't need to tell you that, sexual identity, sexual uh, morality. But there is nothing that is sinful that is rooted in creation. Everything that is of sin is rooted in the fall, is to be mortified and repented of by God's people, and, is, and we are redeemed from it and delivered out of it. And in heaven, there will be none of it. And so that reflects a, an abandonment of, of biblical clarity and, and category. Uh, Adam was a, able to sin. He was also able not to sin. And his sin cannot be traced back to the way that God made him. You know, we do Lady Gaga society, uh, theology today. God made me this way. Well, that is an assertion. That is not a demonstration. And if the scripture, if the word of God is our guide, we can, I cannot say about anything that's sinful about me. I'm a sinner too. And there's sins of mine I'm tired of. Um, and, but it is not because God made me this way. It's because the way that God made me is corrupted by sin. And we are not, to, to root it in creation is to make it good and acceptable, to make it normative for present Christian experience and for eternal Christian glory. Nothing that is of sin can be traced like that. And he was able to fall from his righteous state by willing to sin. Now again, how does a righteous person choose to sin? There's a mystery. Now, I, I often point out in, in me premarital counseling, that when Adam eats of the forbidden fruit, we all have this mental image of an apple. We're not told it's an apple, but by the way, all you apple slaves, look at what that, it's an apple with a bite out of it. It's you all, you, you apple, you, you Silicon Valley drones, you, I'm a, I'm a good Korean Samsung user here. <laughs> Delivered from the pregnant man emoji. Do you see that that came out, the pregnant man emoji? Newt Gingrich said, finally the beer belly gets honored. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, 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 but it, when Adam ate, okay, we'll say it's an apple. When he ate the apple, it, it had a dental profile on it. And the nature, it was bound up in the misuse of what was a good thing. This is Augustine in the City of God. How do you have all good and get evil out of it? By wrongly ordering the goods. Adam's commitment to the woman, the man's commitment to the woman, soon to be named Eve, not yet named Eve, was a good given by God, but it was a subordinate good to his obedience to God. And he chooses that which is good, but when it's placed as a good above the higher good of obedience to God, it becomes evil. And it's in this way that he is deceived. The New Testament reflects on it and says, they were deceived, beguiled by the serpent, and they were tempted. Robert Shaw says, in the state of innocence, the natural inclination of man's will was only to good, but it was liable to change through the power of temptation. There really is no other biblical material to account for an unfallen person who is righteous although mutably so, to will to the evil other than deception and temptation. That was the state of innocency. That was our first man. Well, let's look at man in his fallen state. Man, by his fall, page 7, into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good, this, why does he choose the evil? Because he's averse from the good. 
and he is dead in sin. He, and this is the key to total depravity. It's not just that all of you is depraved, but the net effect is a spiritual ability, inability. You are dead, that's the key thing. He is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. There's always been times when preparationism comes into our system. It, it needs to be kept out of it. You can't convert yourself, but you can will to take the first steps. No, you cannot, because you are spiritually dead. This is total depravity. It, and it argues against a limited depravity. Uh, Arminian limited depravity says that fallen men, it says that man is sick but not dead. You are able to will the good, to will God, to will belief, but you need help. The problem is the New Testament data, which says that's not true. Uh, what are the things that fallen men and women are not able to do? Well, Romans 8, 7 says they are not able to submit to the law of God. Romans 8, 8, they are not able to please God. I already quoted 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The man without the spirit is not able to receive them, for they are spiritually discerned, and he's spiritually dead. And John 6, 44 says that he is not able to come to Christ. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's strong biblical language. Jesus says, they cannot come to me. Paul says, they are not able to understand them. They are not able to submit to God. Their hearts are at enmity to God, Romans 8, 7. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, Pelagianism, full-blown you know, full Pelagianism, says that man is not depraved. The fall has no existential effect on his moral, spiritual effect on his condition. He just has a bad example. And therefore, he needs to be led by good examples. I don't know if you know the story. Uh, Augusta had just put out probably the greatest non-biblical book ever written, The Confessions of Augustine. And, uh, and one of the early prayers in the confession became really quite a rage in Rome when it came out. And it was a statement, Sovereign Lord, command what thou wilt, but grant what thou command. And what he meant, because people say God can't command what we can't do. Every time I hear it, I'm like, says who? God does not base his commands based upon my abilities, or he would never have given the Ten Commandments, I dare say, <laughs> much less the Sermon on the Mount. The whole notion that God cannot command what we cannot do is, is, is secular humanism. By the way, Ar Arminianism is secular humanism arguing with the Bible. Uh, well, actually, a guy, a Pelagius, he's, he's this British monk who's in, in Rome, and he hears this, and he's incensed. Because what Augustine says is, you command whatever you will, but we can only do it if you grant it to us. Because we're totally depraved. We're, he, we're totally reliant on sovereign grace. It was a declaration of sovereign grace. And then Pelagius comes along and says, it's totally untrue. All people need are the right incentives. Now, you think of how semi-Pelagianism, which is the Arminian view, which says that man is able to do so, but sin has hindered his ability, he needs a little oomph, he needs a little help. And you look at the way it's shaped American church culture today, and I, 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 you're probably like me, I look at some of the things going on in broad evangelicalism and I shudder, but they're well-meaning people trying to bring sinners to the Lord, believing that they, if they, if they only get it right, if they only get the sociological, psychological, emotional mix right, then they can get them into the kingdom of heaven. They just need that push. And so maybe it's going to be making the pastor hip and cool, and so he rides the motorcycle up onto the stage, and, or he parachutes in. You know, I'm a former tank officer. Parachuting is the most inefficient means of delivering combat power ever devised <laughs> to mankind. What, I once watched a drop in the desert, and I was like, oh, it's going to be a tough day for those guys. They're scattered over 15 kilometers. <laughs> but, you know, the pastor's going to parachute in, or you know, and, and the music, you know, the, the function of the music being to to move the soul to get them over the top. Now you say you seem scornful towards it. Well, I'm horrified by it, but actually it's sympathy play. It's the unbiblical belief that we can take the man who is not able not to sin. He is not able to will the good. He lacks the ability to believe God. He cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. He cannot come to me, Jesus said, and failing to believe that they're trying to nudge him over, and I feel terribly sorry for them. It must be exhausting. 
my wife and I were, some years ago, we were in a setting where there's an altar call, and I've not been around a lot of them. And I, I don't want to mock, I'm not trying to mock it, I'm just commenting on the reality of it. And uh, it was going on and on and on and on. And I, I, I said to my wife, I'm going to go up and get baptized and put an end to this painful charade. <laughs> she said, you're a Presbyterian. I said, God will forgive me. And, and, uh, uh, and it's, it was tortuous, and, and just the, the, the confidence that the, the force of personality, the technique, we're going to have you close your eyes. You know, as a reform guy who's never been an Arminian, this whole close your eyes, raise your hand, I'm like, what? What, what, what are you talking about? Where did this come from? It's social psychological technique of well-meaning people believing they've got to do it. What, what this says, what the biblical understanding of man in his fallen state tells us that we can only have conversions by supernatural means. If man is totally depraved, if he is, so, if he is not able to will that which is good, if he is not able to choose to come to Christ, he lacks the ability that no natural means is going to avail. We need a supernatural means. And guess what God has done? He's placed it in our hands. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, not of natural manipulation, but of imperishable. How? By the living and abiding word of God. The supernatural power of the word that makes the dead and, and brings them to life. One of my favorite passages is Ezekiel 37. Uh, Ezekiel, I mean, if I think it's say, Rick, who do you feel most sorry for in the Old Testament? Ezekiel. No, Job. Job's always number one. Ezekiel's number two. Here he is. He's also, he's in the, he's with the first wave of exiles. He's on the Cherish Canal. And God comes and he's in the visions. And it's like, okay, you're going to symbolize the fall of Jerusalem. Lie on your side for 270 days and cook your food with dung. He's like, what? Say that again? <laughs> and Ezekiel literally goes, uh, not the dung. And the guy goes, oh, okay, I'll cut you slack. We'll pretend it's dung. You don't have to actually. And he's like, okay, I'll lie on my side. <laughs> and after all these trials, he finally graduates his little prophetic seminary. And, um, and God, he, he gets his first call. In Ezekiel 37, first Presbyterian church of the Valley of Dry Bones. <laughs> Now, here's a line that I love. I'm saving it. My kids, they, they've heard me say it so many times, they mock me over it. But here it comes. Get ready. You think your church is dead. <laughs> His was decomposed. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and, you know, and there's valley strewn, there's bones, bleached bones thrown over it. And, and, and what does God say? Prophesy, son of man. Well, actually, he starts off, what are you going to do, Ezekiel? And Ezekiel's slightly, he's a veteran minister, therefore slightly cynical. He says, Lord, you know. Don't toy with me anymore. All right, just tell me what you want me to do. <laughs> uh, prophesy, son of man. Preach. Preach the word of God. He begins preaching to decompose bodies, to dry bones. And as he's preaching, a wind blows. It's the Holy Spirit. And under the preaching of the word and the coming of the Holy Spirit, of course, you're thinking, wow, it's like the, it's like the original creation. Yes, it is. It's like Genesis 1-2. And the bones start moving, and they form together, and sin is, and they stand up, they're a mighty army. Now, that's our belief. That is what we believe is not only the only necessity, but that becomes a powerfully exciting philosophy of ministry, that if I will faithfully prophesy, son of man, preach the word of the Lord, preach it soberly, preach it straight up, preach it with all my heart, preach it accurately. I, what do you preach? I preach the text. I preach it in Christ, but I preach the text. I preach it prayerfully, but I can rely on the Holy Spirit to supernaturally bring the dead to life. We've got an apartment building across the street. They built across the street. It's kind of fun. We're in the west end of Greenville, which was a dilapidated warehouse industry. We're a third built area where 30 years ago we were told we had to move. You know, don't stay there. Today it's like the buckhead of Greenville, if you know Atlanta. It's high-rise condos and mixed-use sparkling new buildings all around us. And one of the buildings they put in was a link apartment across the street. And so we began praying for God to let us into this five-story apartment building. There's a 16-story one going on across the other street. We began praying for the Lord to let us in there and to allow us right across the street from us. And uh, I had some very faithful people. It turns out it's not that easy. You, no solicitation, right? And, and after a couple years, uh, we're starting to get converts out of there. And we had, I, I was just told this this week, uh, or, or, yeah, beginning of this week, 
um, of an older woman who's in the Link Apartments, and she's been, she's been meet, she, they got, a, they got a, a woman to invite them to have a, a tea, it was Bible studies, and, and, and this was an older woman. She actually said a month ago, I have no interest in Christianity, the Bible, or God. I'm just lonely, I need fellowship. And they brought her to the Easter sun, Sunday services, and she came back after they said, how are you doing? She goes, I must be saved. How am I to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And we believe she's been converted. Now, what, what, what did we do? Well, sure, there was prayer. We, we did have a ministry. Start. I'm not saying we don't do these things. There's this building built across the street from our church. We're not knuckleheads. So we pray and we try to coordinate it. But what did we rely on? The supernatural power of God to bring the dead to life. And that is necessary with man in his fallen state because he's dead. And he is not able not to sin. And when we look at the world around us, you say, oh man, it's, look at America today, the whole transgender thing. We've lost our mind. You know, when you turn your back culturally on the Word of God, as we did between 1900 and 1920. And we, I mean, I'm preaching Jeremiah, and the great, the central event in Jeremiah is in Jeremiah 36, when Jehoiakim carves up the Word of Jeremiah while it's being read to him. Is that not what our society did in the 20th century? Get it out. Do not read it in our presence. Do not speak. Do not men don't mention oh, you, you swear your oath on it, but never open that thing or we will sanction you. What do you think happens to a society that does that? And you get generations. I was born in 1960, and in the 1950s you had this kind of dead suburban moralism that led to the sexual revolution when I was a boy, that led to, you know, the... And gener I mean, it's just de it's a decomposition process. We're the, we're the valley of dry bones decomposing culturally. That's, that's what happens. And so we shouldn't be shocked by that, but we should take up Ezekiel's place and say, Lord, what should I do? Prophesy, son of man. Preach. I, I, I myself an example. Bruce, well, he was there. I'm a, I'm a secular, pagan, self-absorbed, egotistical grad student, and I walk in the doors of 10th Press and my mother is nagging me to go to church. She's not even a Christian. And this man has a temerity to prophesy. And James Boyce is preaching Hosea 3. I'm sitting in the pews. The last thing I expected. I'm under a deep conviction. He's, he's describing me inside and out. I am Gomer. I am the harlot. It's my whole life. The world says I'm this great success. And the word of God says, no, Rick, you're an absolute desperate harlot. And you're, you're feeding on misery. And then the Lord Jesus came and he bid the price of his blood that he would redeem me. And I go home that night to my apartment. I kneel on the floor of my apartment. And I surrender my life to Jesus. And you say, my parents said, well, it's a fad, it's passing. Well, it's 31 years later. The power of the word of God. We must use supernatural means for man in his fallen state because he or she is not able not to sin, is not able not to reject God. And so our view of man and sin will influence, exercise a dramatic influence on our approach to evangelism and ministry. I find this to be enormously freeing. I really want my life to count for Jesus. I, I labor hard in the ministry. I want people to be saved. I want, I want people to grow. I want God to be glorified, but I do want people to be saved. But, and I, I pray, I study hard, I do my best, I preach my heart out. But at the end, of, and I get done, and I, I, get, I, I typically after my sermon, I go back to my office, I get on my knees, I pray for the Holy Spirit to bless it, and then I go have lunch with my family. And I move on to the next sermon. It's in the hands of the Lord. Well, let's talk about the state of grace then. Paragraph four says, when a God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, he freeth him from his natural bondage under sin. So salvation means we're set free from the bondage to sin. And by his grace alone, he enables them. Previously, they were not able. Now he enables them freely to do, to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet so as that by reason of his remaining corruption he doth not perfectly, nor only, that which is good, but both also that which is evil. That's true. What a big difference the new birth is. Conversion, regeneration is a massive thing. It is a deliverance from the power and rule of sin. We need to recover our confidence in that. You know, the, the, the Augustinian language was the man is able to sin, not able not to sin, the converted man is able not to sin. 
And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 13 to 14, that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. We now are able not to sin. What a great thing that is. What a difference it makes in our lives and in our witness and our, our worship. We now are able not to sin. Why? Because it involves a regeneration of our natures. At 2 Corinthians 5, we saw today, if anyone is in Christ, is new creation. It's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has gone. Now let me say this. In recent years, in Reformed Presbyterian, I suppose Reformed Baptist as well, circles, there's been such a reaction against legalism that there has been a teaching of our struggle with sin in this, in this present life as Christians to be essentially the same as that with total depravity. Uh, there was a debate some years ago with a man named Tully and Chavigian. I was one of his debating partners. And he wrote an article said, I, uh, we are totally, we're still totally depraved. And I wrote an article responding to it says, thank God I am not totally depraved. Um, and what did I mean? Well, while I'm still affected by sin everywhere, you can still point into my mind, my heart, my hands, my eyes, my mouth, and you will see that there is a corrupting influence of sin. I am no longer not able not to sin. I am no longer spiritually dead. I am spiritually alive. And of course, the New Testament then teaches, treats Christians as people who not only have a free will, everybody has a free will. We have the ability to exercise our choices. But I now have the moral power in Christ to obey. Isn't that, and, and we need to treat our children that way. I know you're a sinner, but you, and you're a professing believer. I believe you're a born-again believer. You have the ability to walk in God's ways. We need to, a person that's converted to Christ. We need to, it is not legalism, it's not performancism to say, wow, here's how the Bible would have you live. Here's how you act as a Christian husband. Here's how you act as a Christian wife. Here's how you raise children biblically. Here's how you, 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 here's how you handle your professional life. And, and you are able to do it. You go, am I going to do it perfectly? Well, no. But what a thing it is. And, and to me, to, 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 be, to be able not to. Now, I was a 30-year-old combat officer. When I was 21 years old, I was a second lieutenant. I commanded, I was a platoon leader for tank platoon. And I was a little intimidated about giving orders to older men who were combat veterans, and my company commander gave me advice. He said, cuss at them, and it'll help you. <laughs> just start cussing a lot, and, just, and I, so I started cussing. And but 10 years later, I'm 30, and I'm cussing. And my poor parents, who raised me decently, you know, they're like, you know, that was a strong word, and I just flew out of my mouth. And as soon as I was converted, the Lord took that away. As soon as I was converted, he took that away. And that, that was mercy because I couldn't have functioned in the church with <laughs> F-bombs. I mean, you know, I, I just, it wouldn't have worked. And I, I, I still have the ability to use bad language. It's still in there, but it's pretty far down, to be honest. I don't really struggle fundamentally with my speech that way. And that was mercy. There were other things you did not take away right away. When I was in fraternity in college, I began chewing tobacco because we were manly and cool. And then I was a combat officer, and we, you're starving, and you're, you know, we would do 72 hours without sleep all the time. And so you're dipping. And turns out that's not easy to stop, I learned. And that was brutally hard to stop. I could go two weeks. I'm convert I was actually starting seminary, and uh, I was still dipping, and I'm embarrassed by this. I'm going to be the dipping preacher. I'm like, no, I do not want to be the dipping preacher. <laughs> this is so long ago, I almost forget about this, but this is a true story. And I could go two weeks or so by sheer, because it's a brutal, nicotine's a brutal, and chew tobacco is like a very strong form of it. And I would be fine, then I'd be driving past the 7-Eleven, and I'm tired, and uh, and I'd go Copenhagen. Um, and I had to pray, my, I had to beseech God in prayer, deliver me from the, I, and I went to him and I said, Lord, the truth has been shown that I am too weak to do it. I, I can't, it's just too, the physical cravings and the fatigue. I am I'm just, would you help me? Would you sovereignly break the power? And he taught me the lesson through prayer. I was able to experience, I haven't had a dip or wanted a dip in 25 years. The thought of it, I'm just like, no, and no, I know how powerful it is. And somebody here is dipping, I mean, that's fine. I'm just telling you my story. 
I was convicted that whatever is not of faith is sin. And that was not a faith. And I needed to, my ministry, did, I didn't need to be right the dipping pastor. I, I get, you get that out of your minds now that I've said that. <laughs> don't, don't lodge it in there. I was able to break that, not by the flesh, but by the spirit. And here's the good news, that you are able to change. Isn't that exciting? You are able, as a pastor, I run across people, and there's usually just one, and there's 50 things. But here's the thing, you don't need to change 14 things to revolutionize your life. That's my problem learning golf. My father said, Ricky, and my view is, life's frustrating enough already without adding <laughs> golf to it. I mean, I'm all for walking. But. And Ricky, feet, knees, shoulder length apart, knees slightly bent. I'm, Daddy, can you, give, can you give me like two to work on and then the next one? No, you got to do all 14 at the same time. I have a decent stroke, but I didn't like it. No, no, God, here's the thing. If you take the number one thing that everybody who knows you would go, oh, yeah, it's impatient. Oh, yeah, he's harsh. In it. He, the way he speaks is really too harsh. She's, uh, she gossips. I mean, I, I, what, don't ask me. You have spouses to tell you what your sins are. <laughs> you know? And if not them, you have friends and neighbors. You just take the number one sin issue that everybody, and in some cases, it is, it is bringing massive pain to your family, uh, the super anger, the anger of a father who's raising his explosive anger is, lead, is alienating his family, or, or, or neg it's, it's men and women both. Brothers and sisters, you are able not to sin. You not only should not continue to sin, you need not to consider you sin. And it is not legalism for the pastor to say, I invite you in Christ to sanctification to be delivered from the present power of your sin, whatever it is, by the supernatural power of Christ. And it may take a while. I'll give you a personal example. Um, I, I don't like to be too autobiographical, but I was raised in a military family where it was a virtue to shoot first. And 85% of all tank battles, the side that first shoots first wins. And I was raised in a, uh, a candor-motivated environment, and I might have a quick draw on my conversational response. And I was aware that this is not uniformly useful. It's useful in meeting engagements of tank forces, but not so useful in, say, for instance, marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm not a, I, I, I don't, I think I'm a kind person, I, I really do, but I was not gentle. So I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, I want to be better. I want, to ch I want you, to, I want you to, to give this grace to me and work it into my life. And I began praying and memorizing scripture. And this is where the Puritans did their journaling. It wasn't that they were morbidly introspective. Some of them were. But on the whole, they had projects going on in their care. They were mortifying. Paul says in Colossians 3, put to death that which is earthly in you. And by the way, it's not behaviors. It's attitudes, lust, envy, you know, greed. Put the, put the attitudes to death. And I began pursuing. And I, I, I certainly don't think this is a strength of mine now. But even my wife said to me one day, you know, you're just much gentler than me. And I didn't tell her I was doing this. You're just gentler than you were. I said, ah, I have been prayerfully aiming to be. And, and that's great to be married to a woman who she has her projects going on too. Why should we not learn to love each other more? What's keeping us from loving? Our defensiveness, our reactiveness, our passive aggressiveness. I, it's all our S's. I mean, we're just, we have this sin we are able not to sin. And to me, it's exciting. And, and usually these things are multi-year projects. But particularly if there's a sin issue defining you that people said, look, this guy's got a sin issue that's just, it's really the problem. This woman, I mean, the way she speaks to her husband, I would never tolerate. You need not because you are not totally depraved. You are not man in the fallen state. You are man and woman in the regenerate state. And so the New Testament put off that which is the old man, put on the new, which is being made in the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. We are able to walk in the Spirit. And so we must, be, we must contend with our old spiritual nature. We, should not, we not only should not sin, we need not sin, and yet we do sin. You know, I was talking to my congregation last Wednesday night, and I, I, I don't think it's in here, but Romans 7 is so fascinating. Because the biblical doctrine of sanctification includes the awareness that you are going to struggle with sin. 
and, and it occurs to me, Pastor, that people don't get that. They say, if I'm struggling with sin, maybe I'm not a Christian. And I want to go, no, it's actually it's only Christians who struggle with sin. The problem is when you're not struggling with sin. You know, and, and, and you got, maybe you have a porn issue. You go, I feel like I'm not a Christian because I'm struggling with it. No, no. I've never had a non-Christian come to me. I, 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 now I've only had a mere 30 years in pastoral ministry, but in my limited experience, I've never had a non-Christian come to me and say, Pastor, I loathe my sin. I, I abominate my wickedness, and I desire to be holy. Uh, this has never happened to me that unbelievers come and done that. Why? Because they're spiritually dead. I've had many Christians come to me and say, I don't think I'm saved because I'm struggling with sin. Well, listen to, the, listen to this little entry from Paul's, Paul's journal here from Romans. And this is not pre-regenerate Paul. It's regenerate Paul. He says, I'll start at verse uh, 15. I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Haven't you been there? I'm so sad. I did it again. I was boastful at the party. Why do I always have to, uh, if they have something, why do I have to upgrade them? I made all conference. I was all state. <laughs> you know? Or, or why was I naggy? I mean, it's just like, oh, I meant not to do it. And I went through and I got this automatic sin thing going on, and I did it. This is Paul saying. I, I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not. It's what I keep on doing. Now, if I do want what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but still who dwells in sin that dwells in me. For I find it a law to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. You see, here's the problem. In the age of grace, the Christian in the state of grace still has the old man. We're, we're at peace with God, but we're at war with sin because we still have the, the, the corrupting effects of our sinful nature that are alongside, uh, Barnhouse said, we've got this corpse attached to us, and it stinks, and people can smell it off of our lives, and I'm wrestling with sin. Uh, he says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And people come to me, and I go, you stopped reading. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. That is the testimony of an apostle in his own existential struggle with his fallen nature. That is someone who is able not to sin, taking it seriously and getting after it. So you come to me and you go, I'm that way, therefore I'm a, I'm a very low Christian. I'm going, you're practically apostolic. <laughs> but what you may not do is say, I declare peace with it. You may not, in the PCA, it's been the same-sex attraction. If this is same-sex attraction, I'm fine with that. If you say, I have homosexual desires and this is me, God bless you, let me pray with you. And come to my house for dinner. But when you say, I'm gay, I go, that's not accepted. You are denying the power of the gospel. Paul never says, so I just, I'm not able not to sin. No, you are able not to sin. It's not creation, it's the fall. You're delivered, you have the powers working in you. You're to be at war with sin. You're at peace. No, the, this is why it's easier to be a non-Christian. They're, they're at war with God, but at peace with sin. So the non-Christian, the people actually say, this is Paul in his non-Christian state, I'm going, dude. No non-Christian talks about hating and loathing his sinful state and being so frustrated with himself and calling himself wretched because he's not fully sanctified. It's only the, the man in grace who says this. Uh, this is the picture of the Christian life. And so it is not perfect in this life, but what a great thing it is to be a Christian. There is growth. I look back on the man I was 10 years ago now, and I'm a little embarrassed. Because, and I have, I have been, and, and other, in some ways, in some ways I've not been, but in other ways I've been applying myself to my mortification of my sin and my spiritual growth. I look forward 10 years from now saying, I'm a little embarrassed by the man I was 10 years ago, i.e. now. This is not it. There's growth. There's an upward call. So Paul said, I, I'm not perfect, but I press onto the upward call in Christ Jesus to take hold of that for which he laid hold of me. There is growth. Why should I not be more loving? Why should people not be more blessed because they spent time with me? Why should not uh, God get more glory out of the, the, the way that my will expresses what I think and what I desire? 
I, I, I can grow. I am able not to sin. So away with this evangelical reformed antinomianism that celebrates depravity. I had a young woman come to me after church. I never saw her before or after. And she said, Pastor, I'm coming through town. I've, I've become reformed. It's been great, but I have a question. I'm like, yeah, what's the question? Do I have to drink heavily to be a Calvinist? I said, well, you don't have to, but you should. No, I, I, and, I, and I thought to myself, that's what we're selling people. That's what we're telling Christians. That spiritual, Christian liberty is, is, is reveling in your sin because you're justified and elect. You've been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be what? holy and blameless. And I said, don't, I'm so sorry. And it's people, so many, it's as young Christians in reaction to their fundamentalist youth. And now they're going to get tattoos. And you're not going to hell if you get a tattoo, but you're in trouble if you're my child. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> you're uh, you're going to face an unhappy father if you put a tattoo in your body. Um, and, uh, and you can, you know, why would a Christian who's able not to sin want to get drunk at the party? Want to sin sexually. That's not an expression of liberty. That's an expression of the depravity from which we've been set free. And yet we're living in a church culture in America, in the PCA today, and maybe in your denomination too, where wide swaths, campus ministers and whatnot, are laughing about drunkenness and sexual indecency because you're justified. No, no, we are, we're, we're, we're not totally depraved anymore. We are able not to sin. Let's, be, let's pursue holiness. That holy heart that reflects the beauty of God. Let's pursue it with all we have. All right, one more slide. And it's the state of glory. The will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to good alone in the state of glory only. Uh, the biblical teaching is that when we die, or when Christ returns, we will, we will then immediately be made perfect. That's pretty exciting. You know, it's like Christian death. And we've had a, a, just a run of death in our church this calendar year. I mean, we've had so many die, all, mostly older people. Some of them were a little shocking. And I buried a woman last week, yeah who I, I just spent a, a wonderful time with her at, at the death, but I went to her in the hospice. She kind of suddenly declined, and I, I, on Wednesday night I said, I'm going to go by her house. I called, they said she's in the hospice. I stopped by the hospice Thursday. She dies, you know, the next day. And so I, and I'm the preacher, so I talk death. And so I show up there and I said, do you, do you know that you're dying? Because nobody else is going to say that, so I have to say it. She goes, I thought that's what this was. Yes. <laughs> You are dying, and you will soon die. And let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, one thing with, with the dying, I, I like to do the old and familiar. And let's look at Psalm 23 and what it actually says. Did you see that death is in the middle, not the end? And you will soon pass not into death, but you will through death, pass through death. And your cup will overflow. Now let's think about that. You have your hopes for heaven. You hold them out before God. Oh, the reality is going to overflow. And he's going to anoint, he's going to greet you with that anointing oil. When you come through, there's going to be the completion of your sanctification immediately by Christ as you pass into death. And you will take a place at the table of the Lord. These are symbols, and the things they're symboling of are good things. And you will go, and I went to John 14. Jesus says that a place in heaven is prepared for you. So when you die today, tomorrow, next day, um, you're not going to show up in heaven. They're going to go, who? Oh. Nick Kohler? I don't see it here. <laughs> They're going to say, ah, a place has been prepared for you by the Lord. The Son of God has prepared a place for you. And Jesus says, I will come and I will take you to myself. I said, do not be afraid to die. Jesus promises, you just lie peacefully in his arms. You are gratefully receiving the morphine and Adderall they're giving you. <laughs> and uh, hopefully in adequate doses. And, uh, and you rest your heart and, and Jesus will come. And he will take him to yourself. And you will be perfected. What does John say? We will, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And her family members who were not Christian, this is going on with non-Christian family members sitting right there. It's very interesting. Um, and they said it was just, wow, the next day for her. But Christians should have joy about death. We are never reconciled to death. Death is the enemy. I think of Jesus in John 11 when he shows up at Lazarus' tomb. 
Jesus has the answer to death. He still weeps. In fact, he's going to resurrect Lazarus in about four minutes. But death affects Jesus to such a powerful extent that he weeps, even though he's going to. So I, I, we're never reconciled to death. We have tears. I, I like to say, being a Christian makes me a lot less human, but more human. I have a broader capacity for joy and a broader capacity for sorrow, deeper. And we face it with grief in our hearts, but the joy of knowing that those who've died in the Lord are in the state of glory. They're in the state of glory, and our entry into heaven, into glory, involves a final sanctification of our nature. I, I love the statement in Hebrews 21. It's, it's describing the, the victorious church, and it says, you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Now you and I are the righteous, but we are not the righteous made perfect, as, our, as anybody who knows us well can amply attest. Anybody who teaches spiritual perfection, I'm like, you clearly lead a solitary life, because you know, Wesley was once that great man, but difficult man, John Wesley, was preaching spiritual perfection, and this is, I'm not making this up, his wife was in the back of the crowd shouting out his sins. I'm like, don't try this as a married man. <laughs> um, we are not the, we are the just, but not the just made perfect. When you die, you will be the, you will join the just made perfect. There will be a final sanctification by which we are no longer merely able not to sin. We become non posse peccare. We become not able to sin. That eschatological state that God always had in view from the creation of Adam, when he was able to sin, it was God's intent to bring him through the covenant of works, which he broke, but which Christ fulfilled for him, which fulfillment he received through faith in the covenant of grace. We then are made able, not able to sin. And John 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. And so you say to me, what is it about death that causes the final perfection? According to the Bible, it is seeing him as he is. It is, a, it is the ministry, it's the final sanctifying ministry of Christ to his people as he takes us to himself. I will come, I will take you to be where I am. Heaven is where Christ is. And when he comes, we are perfected in glory. And uh, this glorification is his completion of the work he has begun below. Jude says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, that's what he does now, he's able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That is what he's going to do. And in heaven we attain our highest freedom. Terry was talking that wonderful illustration about the cart horses. To do what you were designed to do. You, what we choose to do will be perfectly in line with what we were made to be and designed to be. It will create the greatest good. It will lead to the highest, most perfect communion with God. We will be free, free indeed, free at last. We will be fully free, uh, willing only that which is good and to God's glory.